Welcome to Impact Makers Radio, featuring industry thought leaders sharing problem-solving insights to help grow your business and live the life you love. And here's your host, Stuart Andrew Alexander. Hi, and welcome to another Let's Talk Divorce Conversation. And on this segment of the show, ladies and gentlemen, I have family law attorney Robert Salser, who is a partner at Williams Family Law PC, and is calling in all the way from Doylestown in Pennsylvania. Now, Robert, who is certainly considered to be a leader in the area of family law, will be talking to you today about the financial ramifications of divorce. So, if you are one of the many divorcing couples in the Doylestown, Pennsylvania area, it might be a good idea for you to down tools, take a break, grab yourself a quick drink, log out of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or any other kind of distraction which may divert your attention from today's show. Pick yourself up a notepad and pen and get ready to take some notes as Bob shares with some tips with us today. So let's not keep him waiting any longer. Welcome to the show, Bob. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you for having me. You are so welcome. So, Bob, in your own words, could you just briefly share what kinds of people you serve and the various types of situations they find themselves in when they come to you for your help? Certainly. I think it's important to start by saying any of the advice or statements I make today will be in consideration of Pennsylvania laws. That obviously is where I practice. Specifically, I'm located in the suburbs of Philadelphia and maintain my primary practice in Bucks and Montgomery counties. In terms of the clientele, I, by and large, am meeting with persons who are either considering a divorce or custody action or are already embroiled in a divorce or custody action. I also extend that family law into areas involving protection from abuse and cases in which children and youth protective agencies are involved, but the bulk of the practice relates to divorce, which tangentially involves custody and also support matters. Okay, great. So it goes without saying then, Bob, that anything you share with us today is not legal advice or legal assistance. Now, I'm pretty sure in all the years that you've been out there helping divorcing couples that you've come across quite a few misconceptions. However, due to the uh, yeah amount of time that we have, could you just share the most common misconception that you come across while you're helping these people? Certainly, and I'll say that the Internet has not been helpful in this area as many people freelance and do their own investigation before seeing me, and, of course, much of what they look up tends to be wrong. Mm -hmm. I find, though, if I had to pick one misconception that stands out, it would be that the income-dominant spouses, meaning the spouse who earns substantially more than the income-dependent spouse, frequently is under the misconception that he or she should therefore be entitled to a disproportionately large amount or percentage of the marital estate, when in fact that is not the case. And I try to explain it by saying that the theory behind giving the income-dependent spouse a disproportionately large percentage of the marital estate is that divorce is by and large a financial disaster, such that the party who earns more is likely to recover fast. But I do find many people are shocked to find that, and in the cases of the income-dominant spouses, they're very unhappy to find that to be the reality. And I think the common spread at where I practice would be between 50 and 60% going to the income-dependent spouse. Okay, Bob. So based on what you just shared with us, and obviously keeping your client's confidentiality in mind, could you share an example of how you've actually helped somebody who came to you with that misconception that you just mentioned, that preconceived notion, and how you help them to gain transformational results? Certainly. Well, when you first meet a client, whether they've done the independent research, know someone else who's been through the process, or are really a, coming in as a blank slate. These are people who are generally, first and foremost, going through a very emotional 
experience, whether they're the ones initiating the process or they're on the receiving end of an initiation by the other spouse. Either way, in situations such as I described where the income dominant spouse is in front of me and believes that he or she is going to get a disproportionately large amount of the estate, once the initial shock of my explanation wears off, I think it's important to say to them, you have to understand it's important to manage reasonable expectations. I unfortunately spend a lot of my time telling people they don't ne- things they necessarily don't want to hear, meaning you're dividing money. You're dividing time with your children. None of these things are pleasant. But I pride myself on never having had a client come to me after the fact and say to me, you didn't tell me what did happen could happen. It's very important to be honest with people, and I find it served me very well, even when the truth is unpleasant, to right up front say, this is what you should be expecting. And when people say, gee, I heard from so-and-so or my friend that in my case, I should get 80% of the marital estate. I say, then you should go hire whomever your friend represents. But when you find out that I was right, remember this conversation. So right off the bat, you have to be very upfront with people, even if what you're telling them is unpleasant. And I think that helps build a a rapport with clients where they know I'm telling them what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. As a reminder, Bob, today's topic is the financial ramifications of divorce. Now, with that picture in mind, and for those divorcing couples wanting to know more, What's the most common but unknown pitfall that they might not, but certainly should be aware of, no matter how they feel, no matter what kind of situation they find themselves in? What's the most common pitfall out there, Bob? The most common pitfall, I think, initially is for those especially who want to accelerate the divorce and get the financial aspects of it over with, meaning I'm ready to cut my losses and give the husband or wife whatever I think I need to give them. The persons who are in that position and ready to roll think that it can just happen overnight, and that is not the case. And specifically in Pennsylvania, you have uh, statutory waiting periods if the other party is not interested in proceeding in the same fashion my client is. And that used to be, before last year, up to a two-year waiting period before the case could be pushed through the court system. Now it's a one-year period from what we call the date of separation, which is uh, an entirely separate legal definition and may apply in different scenarios. But uh, financially speaking, the, the all of my clients, uh, whether income dominant or income dependent, will reach a point where they just want to get the case over with. And If you don't have that same feeling on the other side at the same time, the case will not move with lightning speed. We do all we can on our end to keep the process moving, but much of it is out of our control, which again comes back to being upfront with clients about what the law says and what the statutory waiting periods are. That sounds like a really great insight that's going to be very useful for the listener listening in today. Now, Bob, just really briefly, how many years have you been practicing family law? I've been practicing family law not quite six years. Before that, I was a district attorney for seven years prosecuting criminal cases. Okay, so in those six years of practicing family law, when you wake up in the morning, if you think back about all those hundreds of cases that you've dealt with, and even going up to the present day, you wake up in the morning, you have a full day's work ahead of you helping these people who find themselves in the unfortunate position of a divorce case. How how does Bob feel on a morning like that? Is this something you're still motivated to do? I think I'm always motivated to do it. Part of the reason is no two days are the same. There's no monotony in this field. Uh, There are days where I know I'm headed into a full day of trial, which are probably my favorite days because I just love litigating. But there are plenty of days I'm not in court, and a lot of the things that go on in court are the result of tremendous preparation behind the scenes in my office. Uh, But even when I'm not preparing for trial, 
in a given day, I may touch in some variety 15 files. You get unexpected phone calls, unexpected emergencies, letters, emails, requests by the court, requests by opposing counsel. You really never know what your day entails. You think you do because you have a calendar laid out, but there are always deviations from it. And I enjoy that. I like being busy, and I like the fact that I don't necessarily know each day how my day is going to end. So it's always good to hear a little bit about the personal side of my guests. Um, if you could just share a few moments going into your background and especially your formal education and your experience as it relates to the topic of family law. Uh, certainly. I was graduated from the University of Pittsburgh with a degree in English writing in 2001. I was then graduated from the Catholic University of America's School of Law in Washington, D.C. in 2004, and then later I sought a legal master's degree, so I was awarded a degree in federal taxation from Boston University as well. And in terms of family law, I've always said that my prosecutorial days prepared me well for this. I prosecuted and charged and dealt with a number of vehicular homicide cases as a prosecutor. That was my specialty. And those victims were truly at the worst point in their lives, such that although I know people going through divorce and bitter custody battles are at low points, I've seen the lowest of the low. And just as I wanted to help those victims in as much as I could when I was prosecuting, it's nice to be able to help people who are at a low in a family law case. And on many occasions, I've said to clients who I've developed relationships with at the end of their case, do you remember when we met a couple of years ago in the kind of shape you were in? And they say, yeah. And I say, look at you now. Mm. You're doing great. They think back. I go, yeah, it really has been a journey. But it is rewarding when you see somebody who comes in at a low leave on a high. Right. And it must also be rewarding to, as you said in your own words, to see someone who came in on the low and leaves on the high, but also to see what happens with their children, because they are the, the, the hidden victims in, in a divorce process, right? I always believe so, and I refuse flatly to engage in circumstances or situations where I believe children are being used as pawns. I try to be very sensitive to that. I have two children of my own, and I get to know these children in custody cases without necessarily having met them because I've read about them, I've read evaluations of them, I've talked to therapists, and there are occasionally times as the children are a little older or for a variety of circumstances I get to meet them or I hear from a client years later and I say, hey, how are the kids? And it's always rewarding to hear that they're doing well. Sometimes they're not and that's unfortunate and that's just the reality of this business. But if you can do something that makes a case better for a child, that's probably the most rewarding part of my job. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that with us, um, Bob. So, Bob, we're coming towards the end of the show. And just for now, I'd just like to picture the kinds of divorcing couples who come to you for your help. And they're wanting to dig a little bit deeper into the topic of the financial ramifications of their divorce. Now, with that in mind, then, uh, Bob, what final thoughts would you like to share before we move on to our final question for today? Well, if anyone is contemplating heading down this path or simply wants to gather information, I know a little bit of information may be a dangerous thing, but it's always good to understand if you're going through marital difficulties what rights you have and what rights you don't because that may affect the next move you make. So I would suggest if anyone's in this unfortunate situation that they get information related to the law of their jurisdiction and find out where they stand and how they should best prepare if the unfortunate incidents of divorce happens. And again, this is not legal advice, but where would you suggest they go to get that information? The internet or a professional? I would always say a professional, even though I guess that was my anticipated answer, simply because whether it's for law or anything else, I think we've all learned by now that the Internet can be a wonderful thing, but it also may be a tremendous source of misinformation. And advice is only as 
good as the person, or in this case, the Internet, from who it's received or from what it's received. And you don't know who's sitting behind a computer. You don't know who posted something on the Internet. You really need to seek the assistance of a professional. Excellent. You know something, Bob? I can tell we've only just scratched the surface of the knowledge that you have, the experience that you have. Um, But unfortunately, we are coming towards the end of the show. So if there is somebody out there who feels they want to know more about the financial ramifications of divorce, how can they reach you? Where would they find you, Bob? My website is uh, www.com. Box B U C K S Family Lawyers with an S dot com, and that will provide a lot of information related to my firm, my background, and what we do here. Uh, my office line uh, may also be reached at 215 340 2207. And obviously, anyone reaching out to me, I would prefer be in Pennsylvania, simply for the fact that I think it's irresponsible, although I've seen it happen many times, that people say, I'm a lawyer, so I can just give you advice wherever you are. That's really not the case. You need to speak with someone who's focused in a certain area, who knows the law of that area and that jurisdiction. Fantastic, Bob. So whether you're out there doing shopping or working out in the gym, you've got your personal headset on and you're tuning in to the show That's all we have time for today. So once more, as a reminder, that was family law attorney Robert Salser. His friends call him Bob. Thank you so much for sharing so generously with us today, Bob. You have certainly, without a doubt, hands down, demonstrated that you are a true educator and advocate for your client success. So thank you so much for your time today, Bob. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you for the kind words. You are so welcome. And even more importantly, I'd like to say a big thank you to you. Yes, the listener. Thank you for joining us on this very insightful and informative discussion with one of the top family law attorneys in the Dollstown, Pennsylvania area today. Again, that was Robert Salsa. Remember his name. Make sure you check him out. Give him a call. Drop him an email. I'm absolutely sure you're going to be in the right place. So again, my name is Stuart Andrew Alexander, and we'll be back shortly with some more leading divorce professionals in this, our series of Let's Talk Divorce Conversations. So until then, take care, have a great day, and we'll talk real soon. Thank you for tuning in to Impact Makers Radio. To listen to all past, present, and future industry thought leaders and trendsetters, visit us at impactmakersradio.com.